catch up. Um, we were all together, except Ellie, you were not with us. So a quick recap, and plus not everybody remembers uh, everything. We, we're, I'm trying as best I can to take big, the, the big questions of the famous trolley question that, um, you know, what do you do if you could save five lives, but by proactively doing so, you'd be taking one life. Is that okay? We haven't gotten to that. I'm saving the best for last. But in the meantime, we're talking about all kinds of related questions, including um, the Jews can't, in general, we're not allowed to just be passive. Lo samu lo the in the the imperative that we have um, from uh, from from Vaikra tells us not to stand by idly by the blood of our neighbor. We have to, if we have the ability to save a life, we're supposed to. Look, it doesn't just it's not just limited in life. If you have the ability to rebuke somebody and you neglect to rebuke somebody. So Rabbeinu Yonah has a fantastic piece in the Shari Tshuva where he says, you're going to be in trouble for that, for that sin. It's your responsibility. If you could have stopped it and you didn't, call Yisrael Aravim Zelazeh. We're all, we're all in this together. We have to take care of each other. We learned a, um, a very similar idea of Ashivoso that we have an obligation to uh, save somebody's life. Hashiv is gufa a separate, a separate obligation. We have, um, we, we learned that in general, if somebody's, if if um, if a if a hostile body tells us to send out one of our number to save all of our number, we're not allowed to do that. But then we we learn the story of Sheva Ben Bichri in 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 Sefer Shmuel in Sefer Shmuel that um, he he essentially he essentially um, was sent out because they designated him. And anyway, he was Chayiv Misa, and that led to a very famous machlokis Rabbi Yochanan Reish Lakish. Uh, that relates to a lot of modern questions. Um, is it enough if you're going to send somebody to their death? Would it be enough if they just singled him out if he's going to die anyway? Uh, that was Rabbi Yochanan's view. So uh, a possible analogy would be, let's say, the plane that's barreling into the Pentagon at 9-11. Could you shoot it down to save the Pentagon? I mean, these are people, after all, who've been designated for death anyway. They're a moving missile and they are going to die. So by Rabbi Yochanan, it would seem that they potentially could have been shot down. By Reish Lakish, on the other hand, he says, no, you could only do that if the person uh, that you're killing proactively is himself Chayiv Misa, not an innocent party. That's not the case with the plane, uh, possibly. Possibly not the case with the plane, although it's not a perfectly parallel uh, discussion. Um, we learned in general, we, learned, we talked about Rodef, we talked about how do you assess um, between different lives, is anybody's blood redder? I did it again. Anybody's blood redder? Say that ten times fast. Uh, how do we assess the value of a life? And this is where we're going to pick up today. Actually, at the very beginning, um, it's implied that actually some lives, some blood, in fact, is redder. It's just that we are not competent. We're not qualified to be able to make that call. We can't start going around. Oh, a lot of people joined. Uh, hi, Ezra. And um, Matan, I don't know your name. Welcome anyway, but who, 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 who who's a, uh... hello. Hi, Aviel. Hi, Rabbi. He, he's uh, also one of my friends. Great. Ed and get, get, uh, get the whole, uh, got the whole group here. Fantastic. Welcome, Matan. And Aviel, welcome back. So I'm just, ca I don't know how much you were able to hear, but I'm just trying to catch everybody up with uh, some of the concepts. It's a, it's a heavy but important sugi with lots of ramifications. Uh, including what we just said, shooting down planes on 9-11 uh, on and the like. <clears throat> we um, quick, uh, quickly uh, rounding out our survey of the sources. We talked about some lives could potentially be less valuable. We talked about is an ubar, a fetus in the mother's womb. Um, there we know that it's not a full life yet, and certainly if it's, if it's endangering the mother, the mother wins. We can save one, we save the mother. Uh, that's until the fetus is the fetus actually emerges. At which point, it's a life every bit as much as the mother's life. A trefa, somebody who's imminently going to be dying, uh, so that's not considered a full life. And, per, and perhaps there's room for um, you know maybe that's a life that should go uh, before before the others. We'll talk. We'll, we'll see tonight how this is going to factor into the modern um, modern discussions of triage. What do you do when you have an emergency room and limited resources? You only have so many life support systems for example, or your first aid and your first responder and you go to a, a, a car that's about to explode, who do you extract first? Um, fine. There is a Mishnah in Horaios. It's a famous, 
actually it's a couple of Mishnayos. It's, it's on uh, Yud Gimel Amad Aleph, and it would seem to answer all of our questions. Notice the uh, tentative, uh, you know, the tentative tone in my voice, though. It would seem to answer it. So this is one of those classes that you, you if you want to be baking cookies, I know people multitask when they come to Zoom, Zoom classes. If you want to be, I don't know, playing a video game and simultaneously doing this, you'll probably miss half the show. I'm encouraging people to take notes, to try to try to get all the details here, because it will add up to a, a whole package. And you'll have, I think you'll come away with a real, um, a real understanding, not just of the technical answers, but also the Torah's hashkafa, Torah's outlook when it comes to human life. So here's a, here's a very, very in, in, in instructive and interesting um, Mishnah in Horaios that says as follows, when it comes to returning lost objects, um, generally speaking, and we could suggest reasons, this is, each one of these is a thought piece, is, a, is another grounds for discussion. I'm not going to discuss each of them. When it comes to returning lost objects, and you have a, an object that belongs to a man or a woman, everything else being equal, you return to the man first. Okay, property rights in general, that's something we see in the male, male realm in, in halacha in many, many ways. They make an exception in the Mishnah, the Chazal make an exception. They say, if it's a garment, return that to the woman first, because of a major principle we have in halacha, that a woman's busha, her, her shame is much greater. She doesn't have her, her garment, she'll be embarrassed, she'll be, uh, maybe be a lack of tzniyas, lack of modesty on her part, and so that's a higher value than returning the man's garment. Um, then we get to much more heavy, heavy duty kind of areas. Pidyon shvuin, uh, redeeming captives, a subject that we sometimes, I mean, it was certainly prevalent in our history that they would take, they would capture people and then ransom them sometimes for exorbitant ransoms. Uh, but we know from such things today with terrorist kidnappings, probably the most infamous of the last couple decades, uh, you, you were all alive when Gilad Shalit was redeemed. Well, in these matters, sometimes you have limited resources, limited abilities, and sometimes you have to choose who comes first. How do you choose life? So when it comes to Pidyon Shvuin, you know, the Mishnah says, anybody anybody have a uh, knowledge or a good guess, at least, an educated guess? If you choose between a man or a woman, who do you redeem first? A man? A woman. Well, that covers it. One of you's got to be right. <laughs> The non-gender um, identified one. No, 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 no. That was our last topic, Eitan. You can't go back there. <laughs> but the one, Aviel, I'm... I think, studiously avoided that topic. Am I correct, Aviel? I just, I went back to work, so I couldn't be... Uh... No, that's fair. That's even more fair. Fine. We just did a whole series. It's all this stuff that was of interest. All this is... I'm still watching it on uh, YouTube, just, there's, a, there's a unit on, on transgender in the modern era and what the, what the drawer has to say about that subject. Uh, but no, we're not, we're not going there tonight, yeah, Eitan. And the mission does not acknowledge any such uh, ambiguity. I'm sticking um, with women. <laughs> yeah, wh why? Very logically. Because uh, they're most uh, likely to be defiled. Yeah, or, that's it. That's exactly it. And I, I appreciate your choice of, your, your choice of uh, words there. Defiled is exactly it. They're concerned that the woman is going to be uh, abused unless, interestingly, the Mishnah points out, if we have any reason to believe that the man will be defiled, then actually he's redeemed first because his defilement is seen as more of a, uh, it's, it's quite literally an abomina abomination. The, uh, um, a man lying with man is called a toeva, it's singled out with a very strong word, toeva, an abomination in the Torah, and as such, that would be even worse. We don't, we don't um, as a default, as, we don't assume that they're gonna, they're gonna do that to a man, but if we have any reason to believe that they would, then the man would take precedence in Pidyon So it's the more Gemara, case by case. Yeah, go ahead. So would you say it's like more case by case? It is more case by case. Well, that, we're going to get to that in our, the punchline, that's really going to be where we're going. Uh, it, it very much is case sensitive, very individual. Um, mm -hmm. So the Gemara elaborates, let's say, uh, let's say uh, he has, let's say he happens to be the, the person himself is a captive and he has a bank account and he has to decide if she, if he should redeem, you know, or, or instruct his heirs to redeem either himself, his father, his mother, or his Rebbe. How do you order that list? Who gets top priority? One's, one, one, one's self, one's Rebbe, one's mother, one's father. We're assuming Rebbe Mufak here or we're, or Stam I think Rebbe? so. That's a fair question. Uh, Rebbe Mufak, Rebbe Mufak means, is what the Gemara says, something we don't really have so much today. 
but um, uh, your primary Rebbe who taught you most of the Torah that you know, today we tend to have many such people, so maybe that won't, won't exist, won't, won't happen as much. But yeah, the Rebbe Mufak. So who would you put, for, who would you, who do you redeem first? The, the rabbi. Rebbe. Rebbe is a good guess. So, I'll, yeah, okay, anybody else have, a, have an educated guess or, or just a random idea? So interestingly, and maybe not expectingly, the one who gets uh, before anybody according to the Gemara is the mother. Because mm -hmm. well, all these concerns, and they're all valid concerns, we're mostly concerned about her zilusa, that they're going to do stuff with her. So that, that takes a certain priority. Um, that's really, the Gemara brings that in as an afterthought. That's almost like, but you know, she comes before everybody. But let's say she's not in the list. Maybe it's just the person, the father, and the Rebbe. So then we say the person comes first. Why? The major principle we talked about this morning tonight. We have a principle called Chayecha Kodmin. Your life comes first. Meaning everything else being equal, you have to save yourself. It's a major idea in Hashkafa. It comes out in a lot of different ways. I mean, it's, I mean, it goes back. I mean, we, we have this in the modern day picture, the flight attendant saying, when the, when the uh, oxygen masks fall, we, um, we advise you to first uh, secure your oxygen mask first before you assist the people sitting around you. You've been on airplane flights, maybe not in the last six months, but uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Because if you don't save yourself, you're not going to be of much use to anybody saving other lives. Um, as Hillel opines in the first chapter of Avos, he says, If I'm not for myself, who's going to be for me? you got to take care of yourself, your life, everything else being equal, you got to take care of for others. And that comes out in lots of area, other areas of halacha too. It comes out in Hilchot Sadaka. In giving, if, you, if you're a poor man, so you got to take care of yourself. You're not going to be able to uh, give tzedakah to anybody. If I was you reading over destitute Shabbat, or, or your life is in danger. What's that? I was reading over Shabbat that in terms of tzedakah, your, your Rebbe comes before your family. Is that, is that true? Hold up. I'm not, yeah, one thing at a time. Come and come and come. Uh, first, first, we said you come first before your Rebbe and your father. So the Gemara now, the Gemara goes next. Exactly your question. Uh, VL, and it says, uh, in the next context, we go with the Rebbe first. Yeah, your Rebbe comes, your Rebbe comes before your father. Uh, and in theory, let's say you knew that your mother would not be defiled, your Rebbe would come before your mother too. And the reason for that, your parents brought you into Olam Haze, your Rebbe, if he's truly your Rebbe, he's, uh, your, your, your Rebbe Mufak, he's bringing you to Olam Haba, that's bigger. Interesting. Uh, isn't it the same thing if uh, you have to save either your father or your Rebbe? I heard this right. one. Oh, it is? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. First, the Rebbe, oh. the Rebbe takes priority. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, emotionally, that's a hard one to swallow. But again, keep in mind, we don't generally have a Rebbe Mufak nowadays. Yeah. So that's why, that's why it's hard for us to kind of picture what this would be like. I mean, a Rebbe Mufak was really a father figure. I mean, he sometimes in many ways replaced the father. He was the one you went to. He was the one whose advice you initially sought. You know, you you you, you really related so today, to him in that so kind, today of, familiar like kind a, of way. It, it'd, be that? Like a, it'd be like a suffix to, to do it today because you don't really have like, a, like your own Rebbe. Because most people right, well, we're going to hear why most of this is theoretical today. Most of this is academic. They give us a concept, but practically speaking, this doesn't come up all that much. You'll hear you'll hear why if you haven't already intuited. We'll explain why. Other kinds of distinctions that are made, let's say if everything's equal, um, you've got a chacham uh, uh, to redeem, and you have a king, a Jewish king. Who comes first? Chacham. The chacham becomes, goes before the king. The Gemara explains nobody can replace. This is an interesting, interesting Gemara. It says, when it comes to a chacham, every individual chacham, a wise man, has distinct, unique qualities. Anybody, on the other hand, could replace a king. You don't have one king. Okay, so somebody else come along and he'll do the job too. But uh, Talmud Chacham is unique and is, is precious. And so he, he takes priority. I think I was over talking somebody else. Somebody else was commenting. What if the king is also Chacham? Oh, very good. Like, like David yeah, Mark? no, then there's, then, there's, then there's a discussion. Uh, there is a Gemara. I did, it early, I did it recently. There's a Gemara that talks about... <clears throat> you know, how do you, um, different kavod, how do you prioritize different kinds of kavod? And, and is it, <clears throat> when it comes to an elder versus a chacham, what if the elder is a chacham? All of these become complicated um, discussions in the Rishonim and the Achronim. Um, yeah, okay. 
Um, so a couple more, a couple more points from uh, from this is all the Mishnah and then the Gemara in Harayos. Interesting Masechta. Um, a couple more points. If you have a Kohen Levi and Yisrael and a Mamzer, Mamzer being somebody who's born um, from one of the Arayos, one of the um, prohibited um, uh, relationships in the Torah, who comes first? This one, I kind of... Uh, in terms of sa- saving if they're captured? They're all captured. Actually, the Kohen comes before the Levi, who comes before the Israel, who comes before a Mamzer. Okay. But right. interestingly, and this is where the famous line, probably familiar to most of you, uh, the, the Mishnah does say, um, Im hayam, and this is very much addressing your question from two minutes ago, Im hayam mamzer talmid chacham, the Kohen Gadol am ha'aretz, on the other hand, if you had a mamzer who himself was a great Torah scholar, compared with, and you had a Kohen Gadol who was an ignoramus, well, mamzer talmid chacham kodem le Kohen Gadol am ha'aretz. And the moms are actually out us, and I was going to choose the word Trump, but I decided that's not PC these days. Uh, he outdoes the uh, the ignorant Kohen Gadol. And Hashem cherishes such a person. After all, a mamzer is a technical fact. It's not a punishment for the mamzer himself. It's not his fault that he's a mamzer. Something that uh, either his parents or some earlier generation did, it gave him his status. Now, the reason why this is not so scientific is because the Mishnah qualifies everything we just said um, as being the case when everything else is equal. And then when you try to apply it to life, you realize almost never is everything equal. There's so many variables in these questions that mitigate, that, 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 that make every question complicated, and you got to ask a Shiloh. And the reason why, you know, all this was mostly theoretical, it's a concept. I and mean, we, you know, there's what we've just done effectively in talking about Arias, we've said that, yes, indeed, there are objective criteria for you know, determining who should come before whom. But um, when it comes to tachlis, when it comes to the practical halacha, and very interestingly, the Shulchan Aruch does not cite this Mishnah. It doesn't in Pikuach Nefesh, and it doesn't come up so much. It comes up a little bit in Tzedakah. Uh, there are other mitigating factors. Um, in fact, Rav Moshe Feinstein, as a famous psaac, he never wrote it, but it's quoted by his students. Early on in the days of the state, they had limited use of penicillin, but it was critical to saving life. And they asked him, how do you give out the penicillin? And in theory, Rav Moshe could have, you know, come back to our mission and say, well, a man before, you know, a, a, a Rebbe before a father, Cohen before a Levi, and, and, and on all these different criteria should weigh in. Um, interesting, uh, was Rav Herzog, one of the early chief rabbis, asked Rav Moshe the question. Um, Rav Moshe said, uh, just give it to first come, first serve. You just give it to whoever comes first. Just save lives. And don't don't start breaking down, you know, who's going to matter more. So this is, uh, the mission is more hypothetical than it is actual, and it's not brought down by most of the post game. Uh, but there are a lot of modern scenarios that come up that uh, that do raise this and, and related questions. Um, let's say you had two patients, okay? In, with one of them, you know he's going to die. Whatever the circumstances are, you, you can assess that he's going to die. And the other one is more of a suffix, more of a doubt. He may live, he may die. Uh, so the primigodim says, if that's the case and everything else is equal, you should actually strive to save the first one first. And the logic there is that potentially you could save both of them. I mean, the other one could hang on. This one will die unless you do something immediately. Right? There's an urgency with the first one. The suffix may or may not die. Okay, well, you know, optimally, we'll try to you know, save them both, everything being equal. Uh, I'll comment on this. This is about as close as we're going to see. We're going to come to the idea that numbers matter. You know, try to save the optimal number of people. You know, when we're, gonna, we're coming down, we're um, trolleying down the tracks here towards our five versus one right, the, to, towards, towards these variables, try to figure it out. But it's not parallel, if you're thinking about it. You realize it's not parallel. It's all, all the Prima Gaudium is saying, just save as many lives as you can, not one versus the other or five versus the, the one. It's not a contest. We're just trying to do our best in a, in a desperate situation. So that's, that, that's uh, an interesting chuba. Um, here's, here, here's some more similar kinds of chubas. Rav Moshe, Rav Moshe Feinstein, you have to realize um, something that uh, – a great project. Go through his chubas. 
they're so human. They're so, uh, they, they, they reflect such a wealth of knowledge, breadth and depth and, and everything. Um, and, and very much he brings halacha into the contemporary times. He, he uh, when it comes, well, right now, for example, medical related shilas uh, that are unique to our era. Rav Moshe Feinstein is one of the major poskim on this. And here's, here's, here's a point, in, in fact. He, he um, <clears throat> writes 10 different shuvas, uh, essays, answers to uh, questions. The, um, there, were, there was a small group of young physicians, religious, religious Jews, all of them, who asked Rav Moshe some questions, and he answers them. And here's one example of such a tshuva. Um, in this case, and it's a little bit different than the Prima Godin case we just discussed, Two patients are admitted uh, to the, they're, they're both, they both come into the emergency room. Uh, one of them is in critical uh, situation. And if you don't cure him like the Prima Godin's case, he will die. Um, and now here's a new wrinkle. Um, even if you do operate, they project that he's less likely to survive long-term, meaning you could save him and maybe save him in the short term. His prospects are not great. And the other patient who comes in is uh, a questionable whether it's his urgent. So in that way, it's similar to the Primagodin's case. But if you do treat him, it's very likely he will survive. You hear why this is a little different, right? So Rav Moshe says, if they don't arrive at the same time, and one of them comes in and immediately is put on life support, that's it. Meaning, even if there is a way of choosing, if they come in at the same time, we'll hear what Moshe is about to say, right? He's going to give an answer, all right? And then there's one that really should get it more than the other one. But if one of them already started life support, you can't stop that, even if the other one needs it or is, is the more deserving candidate. If you stop life support, of Moshe points out, that's murder. So that's not the case we're talking about. But Moshe says, in a case where they do arrive at the same time and neither one of them has begun any of the life support, he poskins that you, what, anybody have, anybody know or have a guess which, which one should uh, be treated? The younger one, maybe? Or... No, no, we never see age as a factor in this. No, so he, he says the one, you, you do the second one, the one with the better long-term chance of surviving. He says he gives what he calls a tam pashut, a very simple uh, explanation. He says, um, you know, we value life. And again, everything else being equal, the first one's prospects are not great anyway. So if you save his life, the other one may die, and then both of them may die. Uh, so we value, if, as it were, a longer life. Keep in mind that's a general concept. When the Pasuk says, choose life, we're really into life. And even if you know, whereas the, the, the world around us is all about the quality of life. And if somebody's not somehow enjoying their life, well, then what's the point? That's where you get so um, a disproportionate in the modern era um, uh, number of people who decide to kill themselves. Suicide is such a, is such a prevalent, ironic factor. I mean, you think about, I mean, this is not our topic for tonight, but just think about suicide, right? I, we're alive at a time, arguably, of the greatest comforts. We have almost everything we could possibly want. We're living in times of material plenty, uh, so much going for us. And yet uh, it's such a depressed generation, ironically, and that deserves its own analysis. I have a, I obviously have a file on this. Um, but um, whereas the Western world is all about quality of life, um, the Torah is about quantity of life because, you know, every extra minute could be another mitzvah, another opportunity to say Kriyashma, another uh, Mishnah to learn. Right? If you have those, that's what, that's kihem chayinu v'orechimenu. They are really the substance that make up our lives, uh, even if it's a, a life of toil and suffering. Um, I'll also point out something that I did not include. There's a discussion, another lengthy discussion, about what's called chayisha. What about a person who may come back to life, but it's, it's short-lived, like you projected. He's not going to have so many times so much time to live, how does that factor into all of these discussions? And as with so much else here, there's a lot more to say on that. Um, so that'd be like the DNR? Mm -hmm. yeah, go uh, ahead. That'd be like the DNR cases? Yeah, for example, right? We just don't, I mean, look, they can project. They don't know for sure. Best of, the, best, best of their ability. Uh, another Shiloh, this actually, Rav Moshe Sternbach 
to go on to become one of the poskador when he was a young rav in South Africa. He was he had the following shaila and he sent it to the um, he sent this shaila to the Tzitz Eliezer. Uh, yet another we we we've, we've been talking about the Tzitz Eliezer, one of the major poskim of the last generation, also an expert on modern medical shailas. And here was the situation in um, in South Africa. They uh, they had, in, I guess, in one in, in a major hospital, they only had one life support system, uh, and um, when it, when a person came in who is high risk, they had a policy in the hospital that they wouldn't even lechatila give that person put him on life support. Why? Maybe another person would come in and need it. So they wouldn't even like give the possibility to the to, to the patient who is at high risk because maybe somebody else would need it. You realize this pushes the discussion beyond anything we've said so far. So the Tzitz Eliezer responds, he quotes the Chazonish. He said, um, he basically affirms this. He says, uh, you have to go with what you can expect. Um, and that you should you should reserve the life support for the one uh, who has a greater chance of survival, right? So that's the same thing Rav Moshe said, but it actually is several notches more extreme, really, because now you're really refusing the person who needs immediate assistance, and you're saying, no, no, we're waiting for a hypothetical person. On the I, I, and I think the scenario is that that hypothetical person does and. Frequently, frequently, frequently could come in. Okay, a little bit more. That was a little bit of background. Let's let's finally wind up for our for our punchline. Let's get back to our trolley question, which is really how we got into this whole discussion. Somebody had a comment. Yeah, I was just going to ask, how on earth is that supposed to be logical? I understand that if you take somebody off life support, then that kind of is murder. But then surely it's just a lot worse to not put him on in the first place. That's literally murder, if nothing else. If nothing else. No, it's not really murder. Him on, you're, you're, simply murder withholding, you're withholding what's deemed to be um, you know, a valuable and rare, rare uh, mechanism on the, on the, on the apparent, apparently common assumption that somebody else is going to come in and need it immediately. Like in emergencies. Again, situations. If, 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 you, if you give now, it to somebody, yeah. if, if, if you give life support to this, to this guy who's like a you know, really, really high risk, how like is it does it take a very long time to then transfer that to somebody else who turns up five minutes later and that's, that's a great question and i think the question has to be updated and and applied in lots of different um situations um you know i think yours is you're raising you're raising one variable another variable is just how frequent are these emergency cases i'm going to be talking during corona times when people are coming in and the hospitals are stretched to the to the to the extreme to their extreme level of endurance in which it's imminent that other people are going to come in and they really have to start prioritizing then it makes right, the like, what was the really context of that time in hospital? or are we talking about when yeah, it could happen once in a blue moon somebody comes in in which case uh for sure it would seem that one should save the life that's more that, that, that that's pressing that's right in front of you doesn't the Gemara talk about you're not also supposed to prolong life if it's already you know you know said and done that that person's not gonna like that no matter what you do that person right right the, the whole concept of euthanasia uh, and we're not talking about Korean kids here um, so the uh, on the one hand and it's 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 a nuanced discussion there too you can hear there's a lot of a lot of uh, technical. Uh, uh, subtle kinds of kinds of distinctions here. On the one hand, we do prolong lives. It's prohibited, for example, the Mishnah brings this example, that if somebody is um, between life and death, but uh, there is a, um, you're not allowed, uh, several examples, that's what's racing to my mind right now, uh, you're not allowed to do anything um, that would hasten his death, for example, um, you're not allowed to straighten his arms or close his, close his eyes. Why would a person do that? Well, if somebody's about to die, when, when somebody dies, rigor mortis sets in quickly and the limbs all stiffen. And if a guy dies with his eyes open, so it could be that you can't close them after a certain point. So they're already like basically making plans. 
well, you can't do anything that's going to hasten his death because he's lying there meanwhile thinking, wait, why, why are they closing my eyelids? This is not good, right? And the, the, the whole panic that he may, you may induce in him may actually cause him to die. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to hasten his death in any way. The case maybe what you're considering is, um, for example, famous story, Rebbe Yudonasi, Rebbe Nuhagado, right? It's called Rebbe in the Mishnah. Um, he uh, endured excruciating pain through his life and at the end of his life. And uh, he was also on the throes of death. And the Rabbanim were gathered around his house, davening for prolonged life, and their tefillah was affected. Rebbe had a famous amsa, a famous maidservant, a shifcha knanis, in her, well into her 90s. She taught some Torah, too. She was an inter interesting figure uh, who made the calculated judgment that their prolonging his life was simply prolonging his agony. She took a big pitcher, uh, threw it on the ground, made a massive uh, smashing noise. Uh, all the Rabbanim were distra distracted in their davening. They all went, what? In that split second when their davening stopped, uh, Rebbe died. So... If you're paying attention, this is a very nuanced discussion. You're not actually um, hastening his death. All you're doing is removing the one spiritual element that's keeping him alive. It's not quite the same thing as what you said. There was a I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back to our topic. I'd like to wind this one down for tonight, and we have a deadline of ten o'clock, more or less, because I'm giving a share at ten fifteen. So, um, oh, sorry, my time. By your time, it's. Um, by, by three o'clock, and I have a class at three fifteen. So I'm going to try to try to at least address the trolley question. Dean, one one last quick quick rejoinder because this is not really our topic. The whole question of euthanasia, which I could do if you wanted to, at another evening. Dean. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. You. you wanted to follow up quickly? Oh no, I wanted to say um, I I heard this story in the Gemara that basically someone was uh, you know he was already like on his deathbed. And then they, 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 but there was something wrong. Like he was just there and he was suffering and suffering. And then a rabbi came in and a rabbi saw him and then they heard this sound. The rabbi went and stopped this sound from happening and he died. And and they said from that, that like, right, right. That, that's that's right. That's, that's, that like, you're not supposed to like prolong, like in a way, like, I'm not sure if I'm using the wording right, but you're not, you're not. That's okay. what I'm saying. It's more nuanced than that. And it, it, as, as Chazal said, sorry, you have to look at the sources carefully and see what the conclusion is. It's not so clear. You, you can, you, you're not allowed to hasten their death. Mm -hmm. You could remove a spiritual uh, element that's preventing him from dying, like in the case of Rebbe's, uh, of Rebbe Udanasi, but that's not, not exactly parallel. Right. Okay. okay. Um, our question, the trolley, the classic trolley question, there are many variations. I'm not going to explore them all. You could look them up. Uh, the fat man variation, the tunnel variation, in the, in the simple, in the simple unfolding of things, there's an uh, there's a runaway train, a runaway tro trolley. Uh, it could also be a moving missile or an arrow that's barreling towards its object. And at the end of there, there there are five people who are tied to the train tracks. Who, if nothing is done, the train will inevitably run over them and kill them. Do you have the opportunity? You're the guy who's running the uh, the, the train tracks. You have the opportunity of diverting the train. The only catch is there's another, there's a single person who's tied to that track. And by diverting the train, you'll be killing him, but you'll be saving the five people. What do you do? Okay, <clears throat> the basic source is a Mishnah. Uh, it's not exactly parallel either, but it certainly rounds out a lot of the picture of, of our discussion. And it's a machlokis between Ben Patura and Rabbi Akiva, a very famous Mishnah. And here it is. It's in Baba Metziah on Samech Beis Amar Aleph. Tanya, the Brisa teaches, it's not a Mishnah, it's a, it's a Brisa. Shnayin shayu mahalchim bederach. Two people are walking along. One of them is holding a canteen of water. If both of them drink, then they're going to die. Meaning there's just not enough water. There's only enough water for one of them to survive. You can't share it. I mean, you can share it, but it's not going to, they're both going to die if that happens. Right? And if one of them drinks, he'll survive and he'll reach... Uh, you know, they'll get out of the desert or wherever, or the wilderness, wherever they are, and he'll he'll survive. He'll get to the back to civilized territory. Darish Ben Patura, Ben Patura, who's not a not a common figure. Uh, we don't hear about him um, in Shas, but here he's very famous. He's, he's a very famous Brisa, and here he here he has the following opinion. He says, "Mutav shiish to shnehem." 
better that both of them should drink. Vayamusa and let them die. Why? Vaal yera echad mehem b'misaso shelchavero. One of them shouldn't see the death of his friend. Let them both drink. And again, there's always it's a hypothetical scenario. Hashem could come in and seven, send in the cavalry in the last minute and save them both. But one of them should not live at the expense, as it were, or see the death of his friend. That's his opinion. Uh, apparently, that was the ruling opinion. It's an interesting machlokas, the way it's described, because it says, Ad Shuba Rebbe Kiva. Apparently, that was the dominant view until Rebbe Kiva came along and he disagreed. Vlimed the Pesach says, your brother should live with you. And that's the source of this idea I quoted a few minutes ago. Your life takes precedence over the life of your friend. So therefore, if you're holding, whoever the you is in this scenario, if you're the one holding the flask of water, you, you're, you're, you have to drink it. You're not allowed to give it to your friend. It's a variation, really, of, the, of, the, of this Gemara we quoted from Sochim last week that, um, you know, you can't determine whose blood is redder. Well, you know, maybe his blood is redder, but in a sense, in this way, too, you could say, well, you're holding the canteen, be passive, drink it. Maybe your blood is redder. You can't proactively do anything to, uh, to endanger your own life. So far, so good? Okay, that's a very specific scenario, but of course, it could broaden a lot of different possibilities, and indeed, our post can consider many of them. So a, these are all great chuvas. If I'm wetting your appetite, getting you a little bit into, interested in any of this, you should go look up and look, look deeper than I have the luxury of doing right now. But the Chidush Arim, the founder of Ger Hasidim, he and the brother-in-law of the Kutzker, he considers this, and then he, he considers, interesting scenario, okay, that's when two people are in the desert. What if there's a third party who's totally fine, he has enough water, there's no problem whatsoever. What if he's the one that has the water that these two men desperately need and it's otherwise the same scenario, if you give it to both of them, they're both gonna die. If you give it to one of them, one of them will live. How would he choose? Would he, for example, use the criteria of our Mishnah that we just discussed in, um, in Horaios? According to the Chidush Yerim, he says, really, it's a different discussion. Ben Petura would not be relevant. His position would not be relevant to this one because um, he says one friend shouldn't see another friend die. Well, you know, here, um, right, it's this guy who's seeing both of the others die. So that's, he doesn't think that's analogous. He doesn't think that's parallel. He also thinks Rabbi Kiva is not relevant because he personally, the third party, doesn't need the water himself. So there's no question of my life coming before somebody else's life. So he says in this scenario, if it's a third party, what do you do? He says, put the water down between the two and leave and let them go at it themselves. Meaning do what you can, it's interesting, tshuva, do what you can to provide whatever relief you can, but you can't play omniscient. You can't pretend that you, you can't start to determine who should live and who should die let, as it were, Kaddish Baruch Hu or the fate, or let, let these guys themselves figure this out and they'll, they'll figure it out. He does realize, though, that sometimes, and this becomes more relevant for our discussion, okay, you can't do that in every scenario. What if, let's say, it's like a hospital room and you could administer life support and, you know, you're the doctor who can do that. How do you choose between two different parties? And there, you can't have them fight it out. You, you have to necessarily choose he asked that question, he doesn't have an answer. But the Chazanish maybe does. The Chazanish is fascinating here. He writes in his commentary in Sanhedrin. He, by the way, in the previous discussion, he disagrees with the Chidush Are you following? Am I going too fast, too slow? This is clear. So far, so good? Okay. So stay with me. It gets, it gets interesting. I mean, if it's not already interesting. Right? So the Chazanish says, I disagree with the Chidush with all due respect. He says, first of all, Rebbe Kiva, in the case where there's a third party, he says he's completely relevant. If I save another life, it's as if I save my own life. So in a sense, there is this feeling of chayecha kodmim. Uh, so you have to make a decision. You can't just be passive here. Right? And, and that's applied, that, that applies even in this case of the third, you know, when there's a room to go to, you can't just leave it unresolved. And he, he, wouldn't, he also would not just put, put, a, put it between them and leave. He would do something. 
Um, here the Chazunish, interestingly, does cite the Mishnah in Horaios for priorities. So perhaps here, in this kind of unusual case, you would go back to the Mishnah to determine a man, a woman, a Kohen, a Levi, Israel, maybe those would uh, pertain. Uh, Chazunish also writes about Ben Petura. He says the Ben Petura will be relevant in, when there's a third party. He said the third party should split it between the two people who need it. And, uh, you know, Hashem can intervene. Um, he has a tshuva, Chazunish. He considers this is a real life case. Uh, where a taxi driver from Haifa, um, actually this happened to him. He was driving and his brakes failed. And he was heading into a group of people. And on the, uh, you know, what was he going to do? He steered the cab away from those people. And um, he saw this coming, but he had to make a, 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 he didn't have the luxury of time to call his posek and adjudicate over this question. Uh, he had to make an on-the-spot decision. And instead, he swerved the car into a single individual and killed that individual. So that's punked. That's our trolley question, no? So um, after the fact, he wanted to know if he did the right thing or what would the halacha say. And Machazunish goes deep. And, and analyzes this, and I only have a couple minutes, but I'll try to give you three major ideas that the Chazanish writes about. He compares the case of the cab driver with the, uh, with the earlier discussion of, um, of handing over a single individual who will be killed. Uh, and he says, it's a different case. He says, when you hand over, like Sheva ben Bichri, or, or not Sheva ben Bichri, when you hand over an innocent person to people who are going to kill him, um, they're basically murdering him, right? It's inherently, he considers it an act of cruelty. Uh, and not only that, there's no immediate saving of the group. I mean, they may or may not be saved after the fact, but you haven't done anything. All you've done is basically you're complicit in the death of this, of this person you've just handed over. He says, that's very different than this cab driver. This, this guy, when he swerves the steering wheel suddenly, that might, listen to this too, it's, it's Lundus a little bit. He says, that act, when he's doing it, his kavana right then and there is pure, grade A, 100% hatzala. He's trying to save lives. Mimela, there's a guy in the way and he gets killed. But that's not his intention. The intention is hatzala. Right, that's the ikara, that's the main act. And the fact that the guy gets killed, that's an unintended consequence. I mean, Halavai, certainly if he, if he could, if everything was equal, he'd try to swerve the car and, you know, into, into a forest and nobody would be killed. But his major act is one of Atzal. This is the big Chiddush of the Chazonish. He says that there's grounds for Atzal. If you remember from last week, there's Papus and Lulinus, the Gemara and Tainis, who gave their lives to save the, uh, the many, right? Although that's very different because uh, they would die no matter what. Um, in the case of the cab driver, we're trying to save lives, and it's not inevitable that they're going to die. Uh, the Chazunish considers a different case. You remember that when, like Sheva ben Bichri, the bad guys said, "Give," or in this case, Yoav said, "Give us Sheva ben Bichri," or the or the murderers say, "Give us this particular person." Um, well, that person, when he's you know, if he if it's his life or everybody else's life, that person, the Chazanish says, has the status of a Rodef, who himself is not really a life, uh, and so he could be handed over. So that's a different scenario. Finally, the third, the third issue I'm gonna bring out in the Chazanish, he says, he raises a possibility also, he co complicates things. He says, you know, the taxi driver, similar to if you could divert a missile, you know, like the plane from going into the Pentagon, um, he says, there is a possibility, you could also see that as worse. Because still, it, you're, you're directly targeting an innocent party. And he says, in that way, in a sense, it's worse than handing over an individual to the enemy, because you're not actually doing anything. I mean, it's the enemy, after all, who's going to kill him. All you're doing is handing over the person. Whereas when you're pressing a button to move the trolley into a different track, you're actually doing an act. Uh, all of this is fascinating, and it's quoted extensively. He couches it in the language of Efshar, meaning it's tentative. He's not so sure about the conclusions. At the end, he leaves it, we're not sure. 
um, you know, how he concludes. Um, he does not interestingly mention the significance of the five lives versus the one life as a factor. Uh, Ravasher Weiss, contemporary, one of the great post scheme of our contemporary generation, he has a whole beautiful, interesting lumdus in the Chazonish. Uh, he analyzes it. He says, he questions this distinction. He says, the Chazonish, in, in, in earlier on, we said, he, Chazonish says, well, there's one act that's a brutal act, like the handing over of, of, uh, of a person to his death versus a Maisa Hatzalah. The Chazonish seems to indicate might be, maybe you'd be allowed to because really your Kavan is to save the life. Well, Rav Asher Weiss is not, so, not convinced. He says, Tachlis, in either one of the cases, it's a murder, and he uses a language from the Gemara and Makos that we're learning, Mikoho. I mean, it's from his own agency, Mikoho, that he's causing a death. I mean, whether he's handing over somebody to somebody who's certainly going to murder him, or whether he's shift, you know, uh, diverting the, the, the trolley onto a different track, he's doing something. Uh, he considers possibly by diverting, maybe it's not his direct act. There's another concept called koach koho, which is less direct and maybe not really the same, same thing. And he too leaves it sarich iun gadol, not sure what to do. So if you're lost and floundering in our sugya and you feel like, oh no, we have no guidance from the gadolim, but wait, um, the tzitz Eliezer gives, it, gives a definitive answer. And this is the one that's widely quoted and he says like this, his conclusion on the trolley case, he disagrees with the Chazonish, and he cites Rubeni Yona. He says very simply and very straightforwardly, something that we may have intuited all along, and it's consistent with, with ideas we've, we've been talking about in the other discussions in Chazal. He says this, Lashon, Shev Valtase Adif, doing nothing is best in these scenarios. We should not play omniscient narrative narrator. We're not the ones... Uh, who should be determining life and death. Uh, the Gemara, the, the mission in Horaios, you know, assumes everything's equal, but it's never all equal. He's not at all con convinced by the Chazanish that uh, by doing something, your, 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 your intention is to save lives, and that's, maybe that's what legitimates it. He says, yeah, well, you know, for the same logic, you also may be killing them. Uh, he says, you know, the trolley that's on a path of destruction, going to kill five people, don't forget, that's my Hashem. Hashem is doing that. But the minute a man gets involved, he's now suddenly a murderer. You can't do that, says Tzitz Eliezer. And he addresses, uh, you know, better saving five versus one. He says numbers are not a factor. He says if one person's value is infinite, and that's the way we hold in halacha, there's no way of assessing mathematically the value of human beings. After all, the mission in Sanhedrin says that for me, the world was created. He said, um, uh, he, sa he says, we can't start playing the numbers game and we don't start uh, making these decisions. Interesting, it's the one definitive sock in the sugya and the one that most of the later discussions um, revolve around. I did see one more opinion. One of the, um, one of the Rosh Yeshiva in Gush Etzion uh, is a Rav named Rav Yaakov Maidan who says that he doesn't belong in this sugya. He doesn't belong with the great names, Chazonish, Chazasher, Tzitz Eliezer. He doesn't feel he's, uh, he's qualified. But then he goes ahead and says an opinion. Anyway, uh, he says he wants to go. He, he can't accept the Tzitz Eliezer. He holds that the common sense uh, of the whole scenario would indicate that you should save the five lives and not the one. And he argues that most people would, would logically save the larger number versus the smaller number. But he, note, he acknowledges that no, none of the Gdolim say this. He says that's, that's common sense. Now, Swara has a place. And indeed, if you remember the discussion in the Gemara in Psachim about why murder is a Yahare Val Yavar, you have to die and not do this, it's also a Swara. It's also common sense. Who says your blood is redder than the other guy's blood? But then that's Chazal's Sfara. Today, our Sfara is kind of weak in comparison. I was curious about Rav Meidan and if his, if his point had validity. I took it to an Adam Choshu, a person, big Talmud Chacham, um, somebody in Telstone. 
And <laughs> his response was dismissive. He quoted the famous Sma, or, uh, one of the commentators in Shulchan Aruch. He says, kol am klal daiso hafucha midas taira. He said, yeah, his opinion is like most people who are not holding on a high level, uh, their, their ideas are the opposite of the das taira of the gedolim, which is very harsh and very decisive. So you'll do with that whatever you will. Uh, with all due respect, I'm certainly nobody next to Rav Maidan, but, uh, but that was the response that I got. Um, I'll conclude with the Mishnah and Sanhedrin. Um, we, at the end of this, recognize what the Torah says, no matter what, what is unambiguous is the preciousness of life. And the Mishnah says, this is, Kol ma'abed nefesh achas Israel, chas v'sholom, anybody who destroys or causes the loss of one soul, one life among the Jewish people, Nothing less than this. It's, the verse goes up against him as if he had destroyed an entire world. That's how important a human life is. And then the opposite corollary, anybody who keeps alive, sustains the life of a Jew. The verse has it that you've sustained an entire universe. So uh, most of these scenarios are academic and not halacha lemaisa. We should never find ourselves having to make such, make such ominous decisions. Uh, if, you, if you did, it would seem, if you didn't know what to do and you didn't have the time or, the, uh, or, or you didn't have um, the, the uh, post scheme's WhatsApp access or their Zoom link, um, so then you might have to make an on-the-spot decision. You might err on the side, like the Tzitz Eliezer says, Sheval, Tasa, Adif, better to do nothing. Questions? Plenty. Well, um, hold off, Eli, I, I expect from you. Um, but let me, let me, before, in case people will start to sign off, tomorrow we're going to start a series. I may interrupt occasionally, especially if one of you has a really good, juicy uh, you know, topic that you want me to do and you want me to prepare in the summertime, I might have more time to do that. Like I just did this trolley question. This is a brand new shear I, I, had, not, I had not given before. I have a couple others that I have in mind that I like to prepare anyway uh, on Darwinism, creation, uh, evolution, and I have one also on the Jewish role in the world. But meanwhile, I want to start a major project on Avus Rabbi Nassam, which is a shockingly neglected work. People don't refer to it, people don't learn it. And if you stay with me, it is stunning. It's if Avos is considered the basic book of morality, but it's brief. Avos to Rabbi Nassan is the closest we have to a Gemara on the subject, and it takes it uh, several, several notches deeper. It's got some fabulous, famous, famous Agadita and critical uh, life Ashkafa kind of ideas. It's really the core of Judaism in many ways. So I'm going to be doing that um, from the, in this time slot uh, for the coming weeks. Uh, love everybody to join me. Um, Ellie, choose your best question so you don't dominate and give the other people a chance as well. And I, I can't stick around too all that long, so 